So your next session's about to start. Join the session. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the break. It would be great if we could get started with the next session. It's my pleasure to return the podium back to Dr. George Savoyko, who will announce the next presentation. Some people are still filtering in, um, but it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the next uh, speaker. Uh, it's another virtual presentation. Um, Paul Mel Holland um, from the University uh, College London Hospitals, a medical oncologist. He treats brain cancers uh, exclusively. He's chair of the Cancer Care and the CNS Tumor Board there. Uh, so, Paul, I see uh, you're there. Um, and the title of his talk is uh, Autologous Tumor Lysate Loaded Dendritic Cell Vaccination for Glioblastoma. Paul? Thank you. Um, I'd like to say um, thank you very much to the organising committee and also to Linda Liao for asking me to do this presentation. Linda was due to do the presentation today, but unfortunately she's unwell. But I can tell you it's my absolute privilege to share this data with you. I hope you find it as exciting as I uh, think it is. So um, I'm going to today be presenting the final results from the DCVAX-L phase three trial um, and, um, and, and discuss with you the innovative trial design and also share the results. Um, what do we know about glioblastoma? I just want to set the scene really because I think without setting the scene, people might not really appreciate um, the exciting data, the landmark data that I'm about to share with you. Glioblastoma is a very aggressive primary brain cancer. It hasn't so far responded well to immune therapy it's classed as being immunologically cold. It's a very difficult tumor when you look at it genetically. It's extremely heterogeneous and, and um, uh, very, very able to change and, and evolve and evade treatments. It's got a very invasive phenotype um, and um, the recurrence rate is approaching 100%, if not 100%. It's universally fake, really. The standard of care is to have surgery and um, it's not possible to take all the tumour out due to the glioblastoma being such an invasive tumour. There are always cells left behind and there's always recurrence, unfortunately. However, the more tumour that's removed, the better it is for the patient's survival. So following surgery in standard of care, there's six weeks of radiotherapy. That's Monday to Friday on the brain, five days a week, 30 treatments, along with chemotherapy, and then six months of more chemotherapy. It really is quite a grueling, punishing schedule of treatment to have all that radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Um, however, unfortunately, it does not give them so much survival advantage. So even with all of that treatment, the average survival is around 15 to 17 months and tumor recurrence occurs within the first year and then um, the median overall survival from recurrence is six to ten months and when you look at what we might call long-term survivors which we class as um, five years in glioblastoma that's actually only five percent 
So it really is a very difficult disease. And then the question is, well, what's been done about it? Well, there has been a lot of clinical trials in this area. There's been, if you look at uh, this publication um, from 2016, 2018, sorry, there are 417 clinical trials for glioblastoma. And this included nearly 32,000 patients. And of all of those trials, including 16 very big, expensive phase three trials, only one showed evidence of efficacy, and that was the TRUMA treating fields device. Um, but since then, there's been more um, failure in glioblastoma. So it really has been a real battleground filled with lots and lots of failure. Um, the, when we look at the actual treatment itself, the um, treatment originally was surgery and radiotherapy. And in 2005, um, it was shown um, that um, from a large phase three study that by the addition of chemotherapy, temozolomide, there was an addition of 2.5 um, months. This actually was really um, groundbreaking at the time because it showed that actually chemotherapy could make a difference to glioblastoma. And we were very hopeful at this time that actually we could then improve outcomes. But to date, we had not. Um, um, and there has um, been no real change um, aside from um, this in the last 17 years. Um, there, were, there was some data from glioidal wafers, and these are chemotherapy wafers that are put in with the, during the surgery. They're not generally used. They, um, they are, um, don't have much efficacy and they're not very uh, um, they're not very popular to use. But I'm pleased to tell you, say that we've, um, I'm going to share with you the results of the dendritic cell DC VAX phase three trial. Um, when we look at the trial itself, what happened for these patients was that 331 patients from 94 trial sites in four countries were recruited. And the patients were all patients with newly diagnosed glioblastoma. Um, the um, patients had surgery, and then the tumor tissue was taken and sent off uh, to the laboratory. Uh, and following this, the patients had uh, leukapheresis, and with this, they were able to manufacture dendritic, uh, dendritic cell vaccination therapy. The trial was a double-blind, randomized um, trial, um, and importantly, it had crossover. The trial began a long time ago now, back in 2007, and enrollment um, was suspended between 2008 and 2011. And the reason for the suspension was nothing to do with safety or any other reasons, it was actually purely for financial reasons. But fortunately, uh, the trial was opened up again and it was, um, 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 investigators were very enthusiastic to be part of the trial and from 2012 to 2015 92% of the patients uh, were um, enrolled in this study with the last patient being enrolled in November 2015 um, with this trial it's been important to wait for the long-term survival data so as to can see what effect the immunotherapy has over a long period because it's actually with immunotherapy we're looking for what it does to that proportion of patients um, and their long-term survival. So this shows the screening and the enrollment. And um, it was actually a very straightforward study for us to, um, to um, treat patients. Um, the patients were screened, they were enrolled, they had their surgery, the tumor tissue was taken, it was sent off to the laboratory. And then the leukapheresis was done three weeks after the surgery. Whilst the patient was undergoing chemoradiotherapy, there was manufacturing of the dendritic cell therapy. And then when the, this was completed, the patients then had the um, autologous dendritic cell vaccination, just as an intradermal injection into the arm. Um, treatment was given um, alongside the standard temozolomide chemotherapy. And 
and depending on how much vaccination they was able to make, um, patients had treatment at day zero, day 10, day 20, months two, four, eight, and 12, and then every six months thereafter. I have to say, from my experience, the treatment was extraordinarily well tolerated, and I saw no side effects in any of my patients. The trial was a crossover design, um, and the reason for this was because at the time, it was not considered ethical for patients to undergo leukophoresis, which is invasive, and then not have the opportunity to have the vaccine at some point. So um, it was extremely important that this was included, and, um, and, but this did create difficulty later on, and also opportunity later on. Um, the original, therefore the original primary endpoint when the trial was designed was progression-free survival. And at this time, um, when I think back to, the, to then, we weren't really aware of this concept of pseudo-progression. Um, pseudo-progression is something that we see and we recognize very clearly now. And it occurs with immunotherapy, but it also occurs when patients have radiotherapy and temozolomide chemotherapy. Um, so what happens here is that patients have the treatment, and then if you do a scan at the end of the treatment, it looks like the tumor's grown. <clears throat> But in fact, what you're seeing is swelling and dead tissue and tumor infiltrate with um, lymphocytes. And actually there's response to treatment and these patients generally do better when they have pseudo progression. <clears throat> so therefore, at this time, we didn't have good imaging to differentiate tumor progression from pseudo progression, which we do now. So, um, uh, so that's why the progression-free survival needed to be removed as the primary outcome measure. Um, and in fact, this is the results from the progression-free survival, which isn't very surprising. So when you look at progression-free survival, um, there was no significant difference between the two patient groups. However, when we look at overall survival, um, which is obviously what's most important, um, the, um, this was made the primary endpoint in the study and included in the statistical analysis plan prior to the unblinding of the data. Um, so when we look at the um, SAP, we see that the primary endpoint was overall survival in the newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients. So, and what they've done is they've looked at external controls for this study because 90% of the patients in this study ended up receiving the vaccine, um, which you'll see was actually very important for the patients with a recurrent disease. And I'm very pleased that they were had the opportunity to have the vaccine. So 232 patients um, of the 331 patients had um, had the standard treatment plus the vaccine um, at um, newly diagnosed. However, at crossover, 64 patients of recurrent disease also then had the vaccine. So we have the data for the survival for the newly diagnosed and the recurrent patients. But this then means that we need external controls for the newly diagnosed and the recurrent patients. So the external controls needed to be sourced and validated and needed to be done independently of the sponsor. So an independent expert firm uh, was appointed to um, evaluate um, other glioblastoma patients um, that were treated in clinical trials. And they were given a criteria to match very closely with the patients in this particular study. I'm just going to show you very briefly how the validation was done, um, but not discuss it in detail. And when we look at the external controls, we can see that these are very well 
known and very accepted publications that were used for the external controls for the newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients and also the external controls for the recurrent patients. And you can see how well these patients are matched. Um, this data will be available later for people to scrutinize, um, but I'll just show it very briefly. So now we come to the most interesting part of the talk, which is actually the study results. So I'm very, very happy to say that the primary endpoint, the mean genome of our overall survival in newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients reached statistical significance, as did the secondary endpoint. That is that patients with a recurrent disease who had um, dendritic cell therapy had improved survival. The safety profile was excellent. There was 2,193 doses of DC vax administered. Only five adverse events were reported and no significant um, immune reactions. So the, la the important landmarks are <clears throat> that the median overall survival for patients with newly diagnosed glioblastoma was 19.3 months from randomization and 22.4 months from surgery. And this is versus 16.5 months that you would expect normally and was seen in the randomized um, controls. And the um, methylation of MGMT, which is a good prognostic marker for these patients, showed a very enhanced survival of 30.2 months from randomization versus the normally expected 21.3 months. And what was extremely impressive is that the survival of five years in these patients is 13% versus 5.7%. Then when we look at the recurrent glioblastoma, the median overall survival was extremely impressive as showing a 13.2 months median overall survival, as opposed to the 7.8 expected median overall survival. And even here we see a survival tail. At 24 months, we see 20% of patients alive, and at 30 months, 11%, which is much better than you would expect um, for these patients. So there's been innovation in this trial, and this had to come about because um, the um, because of the crossover design that was required in this. <clears throat> but this um, is the first phase three trial of a systemic treatment in 17 years to show significant extension of median overall survival in newly diagnosed glioblastoma, and the first phase three trial of any treatment in 27 years to show a significant extension of median overall survival in recurrent glioblastoma. These are extremely important statements and are very, very exciting and really important for this patient group. And um, what is particularly important that this is uh, this phase three trial shows meaningful increases in long-term survival, both in newly diagnosed and recurrent glioblastoma. Um, what's interesting in, with this particular treatment is it has no, little or no toxicity, and it really is suitable for combination with a wide range of other treatments, which people can spend a lot of time thinking about checkpoint inhibitors, oncolytic viruses, cytokines, chemotherapy, etc. And um, and what's really also really exciting is with this particular technology is that when the patient recurs and they have further surgery, you can make a new batch of this treatment. And so the target, so this tumor evades um, um, treatments because it changes, but you you can actually just change the treatment with the tumor. Um, and potentially 
um, it's worked in glioblastoma. So actually, it can actually work in other tumor types. So it's really a very, very exciting technology. Um, this slide just looks at how it can be um, combined and what people can do with it in the future. So this shows the overall survival, Kaplan myocarp, in <clears throat> the newly diagnosed patients. And you can see this is very, very favorable. And you can see very clearly the, um, that there's no crossover. And you can see the long-term survival, which is very impressive for this group of patients. So these are the important landmark survival rates in the newly diagnosed patients. So um, at 36 months, you have a 20% survival, 48 months, 15%, and 60 months, five years, you have a 13% survival as compared with what you'd expect normally of around 5%. And when we look at the subgroup analysis, you can see here that actually in every subgroup analysis, there's a favorable outcome. So when you look at age and residual disease, and when you look at this particular marker, which is a gene called MGMT, that when it's methylated, the patients have a favorable outcome, but you can see it's much more favorable when they have um, this um, treatment. So this is looking at newly diagnosed glioblastoma. And this morning, this is the first time that I've seen this slide. And I'm really very, very intrigued and very excited that this shows that this technology, which is extraordinarily well tolerated, um, is showing an increase in survival in patients over 65. And you're showing long-term survival in this patient group. And when we look at the under 65s, these people have a better prognosis generally, but actually with this technology, it's actually improved further. And then when you look at this very poor prognostic factor of significant residual disease, this is really impressive. You're seeing that this, this, this technology, this dendritic cell therapy is impacting on this patient group in a way that I would not have predicted so it's really very, very interesting. And when you look at the, minim the patients with minimal residual disease, there's, a, always, there's also an advantage in survival there. And this is the methylated group. So this is people with the favorable gene um, configuration of methylated promoter region of MGMT. And when you look at the five-year survival in this group, it starts to look really interesting. And really, there is nothing that could have predicted this survival in this patient group. And it's so impressive. And this is the patients who've got a very poor, poor prognostic marker of unmethylated promoter region of MGMT. But even they have a survival advantage, even though it's smaller. Then we come to the recurrent glioblastoma, where really very little makes an impact. And I would not have anticipated that these patients would have had a, an impact with dendritic cell therapy. But actually, when we look at the overall survival in recurrent glioblastoma, you can see the survival. And if you treat this condition, you'll see that that is a very favorable survival curve for recurrent glioblastoma. We're seeing 13.2 months median overall survival, and we're seeing a tail a survival tale that goes out to five years. And here we can see <clears throat> the landmark data. So in gly recurrent glioblastoma, six months is a landmark because people aren't expected to make it six months. But with, with um, dendritic, so with DC vaccine, their survival is 90%. And at 24 months, 20% survival, which is really very, very impressive. And at 30 months, we're seeing 11% survival. Um, so dendritic cell therapy, how does it work? 
Um, I think that this audience is probably more familiar with that than a brain tumor audience. So it uses the master cells of the immune system, the dendritic cells, to mobilize multiple elements within the immune system. The technology that's used in manufacture of DC Vaxel is fully personalized. Um, it the inherently targets antigens which are actually on the patient's tumor and fits the patient's version of the cancer. So it really is a personalized vaccine. And unlike other technologies, um, <clears throat> it uses all of the tumor antigens, not just um, some manufactured peptides, um, or it, it makes, and this makes it difficult for tumors to mutate around the antigens that have been targeted. So this just shows a um, slide on how the dendritic, um, autologous dendritic cells work and how they multiply and activate these T cells. And this is just a slide. So um, <clears throat> there's actually a lot of evidence that T cells cross the blood brain barrier, both um, in animal models and also now in um, in humans, <clears throat> and this is some unpublished data from Linda Liao, um, which shows infiltration of T cells into glioblastoma tumor, um, into glioblastoma tumors in patients who were treated with DC Vaxel. So, in conclusion, um, the this is, shows the completion of a large phase three trial, including 331 patients. It was really a mammoth effort over many years and I was very, very honored to be part of that journey with all my co-investigators and with Northwest Bio. Um, there was 94 sites, 70 clinical investigators, four countries. And I think it's very exciting that we're seeing practice changing results, not only in newly diagnosed glioblastoma, but also in recurrent glioblastoma. I can say from personal experience that this vaccine is um, easily administered and it has a very, very favorable side effect profile. Um, the, the use of these external contemporaneous clinical trials is innovative and I think it's been really important for this particular trial because the patients in this study uh, at recurrence had the vaccine and the vaccine was effective, that actually we need these um, um, external controls. Um, and what's particularly significant is that there is a significant percentage of long-term survivors, and that's consistent with immune memory effect by the T cells. And this really can change the natural history of glioblastoma, and I don't think we've really seen that with any other treatment. Um, and we're still looking at the data on this, and I've only seen some of this data this morning, and I'm really quite overwhelmed by it, that we're seeing subpopulations that I wouldn't have anticipated to see um, benefit. We're seeing older patients, patients with residual disease, um, doing really well with this treatment, which is really quite um, dramatic. So this treatment is really feasible um, because there's, so, there's no side effect profile or very little side effect profile. And it really is possible for this to be rolled out as a treatment around the world. And thinking about how we can use it going forward, of course we need to think about combination treatments and we also need to think about what is this, how, how is this changing the immune microenvironment? And more work is ongoing in that. And um, I think it's a very exciting area of research. So in summary, I can say that patients with, treated with DC Vaxel showed a clinically meaningful and statistically significant extension of survival in both newly diagnosed and recurrent glioblastoma patients have an excellent safety profile and it's really noteworthy to see these long 
Tales of Survival. So I'd like to thank um, Linda Liao for giving me the opportunity to speak to Ellen. Sorry that she was unwell to miss the talk, and I know that, that will um, um, be a regret for her. Um, but also to Dr. Robert Prince, who led the study from UCLA, and to my colleague, Professor Ashkan at King's College, and to all um, my colleagues who are investigators and sub-investigators and the Trust Steering Committee, and of course to all the patients and their families who participated in this landmark study. So I'd be very happy to answer some questions now, um, if anybody has any questions. Paul, thank you very much for a very, very interesting presentation. Congratulations on the survival benefits that you've seen in these patients. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. We're going to do about five minutes worth of questions. So. David? Hi. Hey, Paul, it's Dave Reardon from Boston. Congratulations. Uh, really wonderful study and great work. Um, could you comment on um, what was known about IDH status of the patients who enrolled? What about steroid use for patients who enrolled? And um, why you might anticipate the unmethylated patients didn't benefit? Was there maybe some synergy with chemotherapy that caused immunogenic cell death and enhanced you know, antigen priming or some other reason why the patients who got chemo seem to have a preferential benefit. Yeah, it's really quite um, interesting that. So the IDH status, of course, it wasn't stratified for them because we didn't have this IDH status for the patients largely at that time. Uh, but we do have the, the um, um, data on the steroid use. But steroids were um, permitted in the study, but they were um, limited to less than four milligrams. Um, and the um, and then the question about the unmethylated patients, it really is interesting, and I think you're quite right. That's the conclu conclusion that we've drawn that there must be some synergy um, with the temozolomide, where the temozolomide is active in these patients. But um, yeah, it's interesting, and I'm not sure that we can explain all the results. But it's great to see them. Uh, David Marnix Bosch from. Uh... In North Coast Bay, I would like to add something to that answer. Yeah. Thanks, and, th and thanks for the question. Um, actually, the number of IDH mutations was, I think, seven patients out of 331, um, which is lower than what you saw in the, uh, in the comparator groups. Um, so that, that doesn't uh, contribute to the results that we're seeing. Um, the question about methylation versus unmethylation, I think, is very interesting and sort of raises speculation as to how this treatment can best be combined with other treatments. Um, but an answer is that would be more speculative than anything else. And right now, it's an interesting observation. I agree with you. And you know, the study, as, as you indicated, Paul, it really is quite innovative and sets a potential precedent for the use of these external control groups, which many studies are now incorporating to a degree and will make randomized trials much more, um, uh, much more easy to do, much more readily doable. But was there any kind of validation, I wonder, within the study of patients who enrolled to, to show a survival benefit of the outside of the external controls? So, because usually when we bring external controls in, there's kind of an internal group of controls where there's a validation, and then you expand that with the externals. Here, the control group is really consisting exclusively of the um, external control. So, for example, for patients who progressed, um, who got vaccine versus those who didn't, um, was there survival benefit for uh, the patients before crossover or, or amongst the patients who didn't cross over, maybe? Uh, it was any kind of a, it was, could you tease out anything from the internal control patients um, to support the results for the external? control validation. Do you, am I making that clear at all? I think, I think a bit, maybe Marnix, um, if you could comment on that. Marnix? I can't see, is there? Oh, I, I think... Uh, yeah. For you to comment. Oh, sorry, yeah. There, there, well, there was, a little, there, there was quite a bit of validation of the external controls, actually. Um, one thing we did is we compared the treatment arm of all of the trials that were selected for comparison against the external controls and asked the question, 
whether the results compared to external controls in those trials were consistent with the ones that were originally observed for those studies. Um, as you know, almost all of those studies, except the one, the Stoop trial for the Optune device, were negative. Um, and if you compare the treatment arms of those studies to the external controls, you get exactly the same result. So um, I think that's a very important comparison. Um, another thing, we did several uh, sensitivity analyses. Um, we, um, we did what's called an MAIC, which is um, matched, uh, adjusted, independent, compar indirect comparison, where you um, even more closely than the, so the, the populations were already quite well matched in terms of prognostic factor and demographics, but they're never perfectly matched. But you can then go back and more and better match your population to the control population, which reduces statistical power. Um, but if you do that, then you still maintain a significant um, positive outcome um, in the comparison. And then there was another series of uh, sensitivity analyses that we did. Um, just to give you an example, one is called leave one out um, analysis, where subsequently you remove one study from the external control cohort. And again, the results were completely identical. Then there was one other um, test that we did because two of the trials did not specify clearly, two of the comparator trials in newly diagnosed CBM, the two Gilbert trials, did not specify specifically whether they removed patients with recurrent disease. Um, from eligibility, recurrent disease, early recurrence at uh, post-chemo uh, radiation. So we removed those two from the comparison as another sensitivity analysis. That also did not change the result. So that just gives you a sense of the, of the rigor that we went through to, to validate these comparisons. Thanks for that question. Thank you, Manex. Hi. Um, uh, really interesting to see you've got uh, data from external controls here. A uh, question I have is, I see there was about 1,400 patients in your external control. Uh, did you find that you had any non-missing data from all the 1,400 patients, which is what the FDA generally requires? Um, <clears throat> we were, of course, dependent on what was published. Um, and um, so you extract uh, individual patient, you reconstruct individual patient data from the published Kaplan-Meier plots. Now, fortunately, those trials were described in very great detail, and uh, both including demographics, et cetera. So I think in terms of the quality of the comparison cohort, it really couldn't have been any better, um, which was really the result of the, the other studies that were really well executed. So this was mostly a comparison to a historical control rather than individual patient by patient matching using propensity scoring or statistical analysis. Well. There was no propensity scoring because for that you need actual independent, actual individual patient data, and those have not been made available for comparison. Um, I think that's something that we should all stress in the future that that, that, that actually should be done, so that these trials can be um, even more rigorous than they already were. Um, I wouldn't call them historical controls because they were from contemporaneous trials. They were conducted at the same time, roughly in, in comparable institutions of the same quality, um, with very much the same parameters. Um, so that, I think, again, underscores the, the validity of this approach. Thank you. And I, I said there were A uh, clarifying question about the site of vaccination. This is subdermal or intradermal vaccination, right? Not intratumoral. Intradermal. Okay. And, and do you have, there's potential, because the site of vaccination is very important on whether it be oncolytic viruses or dendritic cell vaccines, what's your thought on what your future would be? Yeah, we, we had a lot of talk about that. And we, we put this in the upper arm, sort of thinking in a very simplistic way that the closer you put it to the tumor, the more effective it will be. But often I say you can probably put it in the big toe and it won't make any difference. As long as the dendritic cells can get to a lymphoid organ, probably a lymph node, where they can interact with T cells. Those T cells travel anywhere through the body and they actually make it to the tumor site, no matter where they are induced. Because we have we had talks about intratumoral injection of the right. vaccines and that's that looks like a, a palatable pathway. Um, that would be a completely time. different presentation. <laughs> we have, uh, one more, uh, Lene, uh, Megan, do you have any from outside from Virchow? Let me do that first, Steve, I'm sorry. Give them a virtual attendees a chance. Um, 
Wait, could you turn the microphone on? Yeah. Okay, um, the most popular question from the virtual audience is, what is the process for FDA approval now? We, we, we really can't speak to that. Um, it, it will be no different than for any other treatment. One more question. Please. Yeah, I wanted to uh, answer David's question um, and uh, <clears throat> congratulate Paul Holland and uh, the Northwest Bio team. Without being self-congratulatory, my full disclosure, I'm one of the 70 authors and uh, we've been waiting for uh, advance like this for a long time. David, in addition to the external controls and the numbers, um, we have some unpublished data from Penn. Uh, Dr. Mohan's team has been looking at radiological markers and we'll present that in June. And that's obviously, uh, we'll add to the story uh, uh, in terms of uh, using each patient as a control and, uh, and having uh, an, another dimension of efficacy. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Sorry, I went over a little bit on time, but uh, I think this is an important uh, presentation uh, that generated very interesting questions. So now we move forward with another uh, virtual presentation. Um, Peter Sorger, uh, Professor of Systems Biology at Harvard Medical School, head of Harvard Program in Therapeutic Sciences. Uh, I see he's ready to go. He's gonna speak on independent drug action in immunotherapy implications for drug discovery and precision medicine. Peter.